young, nimble, and enthusiastic, 18 to 25. That is also the age group which historically has the lowest voter turnout in this country. How does that work? How can that be? One of these young men took me around the Capitol building late at night after all the tourists were gone and the only company we had were the security guards. He showed me a lot of back alleys and hidden doorways that the interns and staffers used to get around quickly and to avoid the crush of tourists during the day. And that in itself is remarkable. You see, I spent two years teaching overseas in Bulgaria, a close ally of the United States in the War on Terror. Indeed, they were one of the first countries to stand up and send troops in to support us. Why? Because we had stood by them during the Cold War, slowly finding ways to tear down the wall, first of ideas, then of wire, and then of concrete that the Soviets had erected around their kidnapped countries. I taught at the oldest American high school outside of the United States, the American, co the, sorry, the American College of Sofia. It's not Sofia, even though it's spelled that way, as my students reminded me, Sofia. Mr. Corling, the American College of Sofia, which was founded in 1860 to help Bulgaria build a strong, active middle class following its then recent liberation from centuries of foreign rule under the Ottoman Empire, which finally collapsed after World War I. We've been there for Bulgaria in the past and they are with us now. But what is interesting, you see, is that even in Bulgaria, where the kids I taught wanted to be like our kids here, you cannot just walk into the National Parliament building and see your representatives at work. You cannot tour the Treasury, nor the Mevere, the National Police Headquarters. You cannot even get into the Presidential Palace, outside of which the Honor Guard goose steps every hour. But here, here in this country, you can do those things because not only the buildings, but the power behind them belongs to us, of the people, by the people, for the people. The Capitol building during the day is a madhouse of business and tourists. It is unbelievable that our government works at all with all the people crowding to and fro throughout that great space, which is in actual fact a series of spaces, both physical and political. You can walk into a committee meeting to listen to the hearing of evidence. You can walk into a markup of pending legislation to see who is trying to add an earmark or an amendment. You can sit in the House gallery and watch your representatives rub elbows, conference with one another to make a deal, watch them maneuver with one another in the unending dance of, quote, how am I going to get something for my constituents? And how am I going to get reelected? But all of this is made possible only by the hard work and selfless spirit of a bunch of 18 to 25 year olds. Why does this happen? As a teacher of high school students in English and history, government and economics, even drama, it has been my pleasure to have taught some really wonderful students over the years. It is this handful in every class who keep me going. And so it is this handful of achievers who go out and do what must be done. It is out of this handful that those 18 to 25ers come and with little or no pay, make our government work. But how does one inspire the majority of our students who are prematurely cynical, who are apathetic, uninterested in their studies and the world outside of their own experiences to get involved? How do you pull them away from cell phones and iPods and Xboxes to see how important they are and how powerful they can be? How does one fire them up to realize how much, po how much power they can wield or do we shrug our shoulders and say, well, they'll grow out of it. It is not enough. Not too long ago, it was thought a social crime that an 18-year-old could be drafted and die in a foreign war, but not vote for the people who needed him to go to such a place. Now, he has the vote. And he has been joined by she. But neither of them uses it. Why? What can be done? I will not pretend to know the answers to these questions. If I did, I would have written a book by now and gotten on to Oprah Winfrey. I'd be rich. Well, I don't know the answers. I only know that my grandfather was right. Just as I was the reason he had served, so they are the reason that I must teach. I visited the World War II Memorial in D.C. 
also the Korean and Vietnam memorials. I walked up to Lincoln's memorial, that great temple to the better angels of our nature, the shrine within which each must find what he knew to be true, that a house divided cannot stand, that this nation conceived in liberty must not perish, for we are the last best hope of all mankind. Good words, high words, but also more than just words. There is an idea there. It is not enough that we recognize on a day like today all that has been done, all who have sacrificed, all who have come to build and make this house that we call America what it is today. It is simply not enough. I walked around the World War II Memorial and could only think of Grandpa's words. You are the point that the country is still here. That is the point. I don't want a damn memorial. I was the point. My parents were the point. My children are the point. And so are their children. And their children's children. America is not about what has been. It is not about the statues or other memorials we erect to the past. It is not about national holidays. These are merely the means by which we can come together and recognize that which is the point. You young people here, and believe me, it is strange for me to think of myself no longer as a young person. I still can't quite get that. You are the point. You are the ones who will go to work soon, who will go to college, start up your own businesses, join the local PTA, become a mayor, a county supervisor, a political activist, even a member of the United States House of Representatives or the Senate. One of you out there may be the next Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, or the American Ambassador to Bulgaria, or dare I say it, President of the United States. The point is, you are the point. It is not about looking back, it is about looking ahead. See your worth. See that you must be ready to work hard, to sacrifice when called upon to push through the economic downturn and find that light that leads to the American dream. Today we call my grandfather's generation the greatest generation, but I don't think he ever would have liked that. And not because of any real or false modesty, but because he simply did not believe in such a thing. He did what he did because he had to do it. Because at the time, someone had to do it. For him, it was neither great nor glorious, it was merely necessary. And walking around the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., my grandfather's voice pressed me again and again. I don't want any monuments. You are the point. It is important that the American House is always a work in progress, that those founding words, a more perfect union, are understood to mean this progress, that we do not look back to some golden era that exists only in myth, when we forget what a day like today is for, not to hanker back to the past, but to celebrate how it is connected to the present, then we forget what we are bound to do, to gather our families, see our children, and inspire them to do what we were unable or unwilling to do. It is for us to impart to them that old but forever reborn idea called the American dream. It is not enough to salute the flag, to shoot off fireworks, to have a barbecue. We have a duty to all those who have come before, not merely to maintain what has been built, but to continue building. When George Washington was crossing the Delaware, he could not have conceived of Neil Armstrong crossing space and stepping on the moon. Abraham Lincoln could see keeping some slavery to save the Union but he could not have seen how Martin Luther King Jr. would come to carry on what he had started. It is not enough to sit here and speak of patriotism. We must live it. We must be it. We must ensure it. We cannot know what future Americans will think of us right now, just as we cannot know that our children will really listen to us. But we must believe that there will be Americans after us to look back at us, and that they will believe the same. What those Americans will look like or sound like, whether they will prefer football or football, whether they will eat hot dogs or dinners, whether they will have 50 or 100 stars on their flag, 
What will be important is that they will be looking forward to. So, you who are young here, if you do anything that I ask you to do, it is this. Vote. Vote and be engaged. Vote and make this country, and through this country, the world, a better place than it is now. Don't just read about America. Be America. Thank you.